My mom was a cosmic lady and um, kind of a failed hippie. She like she didn't do it right. She like worked the weekend that Woodstock happened, um, which I think is actually a really good story. I love her for that. She like she had too much work ethic to go to Woodstock. She worked, but all of her friends went to Woodstock. Um, but she's an amazing person and, and kind of helped us to be exposed to a lot of different things. And she was a spiritual woman and is a spiritual woman. So my childhood was definitely kind of unusual in certain ways um, because there was, well, not just certain ways, you know, we were having the Kirtans, my brother became Hare Krishna, it, you know, as a whole, we became vegetarian. It was a lot of like exploration. Um, and so I was exposed to it, but I also was not unimpressed by the new age. Uh, that was one thing that would really kind of stood out to me as I started growing and I saw a lot of kind of spiritual communities still treating women a certain way and just unimpressed and so something that kind of in my consciousness as I was growing I, I really felt like I, I'm a spiritual being but I wanted to be different than this and that was something that was very much current for me and I avoided yoga at all costs just because um, all the people that were doing yoga at the time in New York where I lived it was very kind of bourgeois navel gazing and everybody would like incessantly talk about how they had been in Mysore and I just was, it just was, I couldn't, I, I, I felt like that's not, I don't, I don't, that doesn't, if that's what yoga is, I don't want anything to do with it. I want to be like, I'm like a street kid, you know? And so when I met Yogi Bhajan and felt how much of a rebel he was just in general, everything he did was in many ways a rebellious act um, to religion, to the yogic culture to uh, his kind of cultural you know he, he was from Punjab and so there was so much that he represented he taught women he he just he, he represented to me like a true rebel spirit and a true spiritual master and so I said I want to be like that guy that's 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 you know there's the proof in the pudding there I wanted whatever he's doing I want to do and that's how I got into Kundalini Yoga so that was the beginning but I was young enough that I had some, you know, wild child of it all, but I was so young that it was like not really that big of a deal. Now looking back on it, it was, I was, it was amateur hour. Um, but, you know, so from then on, I, I, I met him, I, I started studying, I started doing a lot of yoga and um, I did teacher training and the whole kind of concept in Kundalini Yoga is we're not looking for students, we're looking to create leaders and other teachers and you know people who can actually be role models in this new time on the planet and that I took very very seriously so that's kind of what got me to step up to be a teacher and he sent me to LA to his school um, in Los Angeles called Yoga West and I taught there for a decade before I opened Rama um, and it was you know I was on assignment it was very much an assignment he sent me on and so um, that was kind of what I devoted my life to. So Victoria is close to my heart because Yogi Bhajan said this word victory is one of the major mantras of this age on the planet right now. So he actually said that you can use the word as a way to organize your own neurology and your system around what it means to kind of be a strong, sovereign human. And so he actually gave a, 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 pro, a process or a practice, very quick pra practice you can do anywhere before a meeting or you know, when you're feeling challenged or when you feel like you're failing, which is a rich moment. So he said you can inhale, hold the breath, and put the tongue on the roof of the mouth and just say to yourself, victory. So you actually just say it over and over and over again, and then you exhale, and you do it a couple times. So that's actually something he gave as a practice of this age, and that will help people to kind of organize themselves around what it truly means to be victorious. Yogi Bhajan taught that how you deal with your failure is exactly, literally, exactly how you deal with your success. And I really took that, like when I got that teaching, I was like, that that is uh, so profound because so many people don't deal with their failure or their success very well. And it's really a, a kind of a linear thing. 
So I, I took that to heart and I was like, I'm going to deal with my failure. Like I have like I winning, like the, every time I fail, I'm going to deal with it. Like I have won the, you know, great lottery because I want to deal with my success that way. And I want to show up in a way that is a role model. Cause I, I don't think we have a lot of role models around success in our society that are, I could point to and say, this is someone who's handling success generously, um, with grace, with poise. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of those role models and I, I think we need more. So it was really kind of a, a moment for me that the true victory is when I fail, when I fall, and I take lots of risks because you have to. Um, and so when that happens, I fail a lot and how, how it was like as my personal practice showing up, like that's like the biggest day of my, you know, that's the highest part of the mountain. Um, and doing that has changed me on a deep level because that has created some sort of kind of uh, reprogramming around our whole strange Western um, Piscean is what we would call it, but this old kind of way of like what it means to win and be successful and who you have to like betray or step on or push out of the way or the competitive kind of these old models of competition and that only one person can win and all this kind of stuff. And in it, it, that stuff, that whole conditioning shows up in every aspect of our society, even in the wellness you know, yoga, but it shows up everywhere. So if we're not consciously dealing with all of this stuff that's programming that doesn't work for anybody, I mean, all this kind of old programming is stuff that it didn't work for. We've already done the like, let's kill each other because your God looks different than my God. And, you know, we've already done this whole kind of thing. And um, even though it's, you know, the battle's still raging, people are waking up at mass, mass speed on this planet. And one thing that I will say that is my big message right now is the majority of the people on the planet want to live in a generous way. The minority of people on the planet, a very small percentage, want to create kind of this uh, competitive, hostile, violent kind of environment. But the majority, and the moment the majority wakes up to this, and, and it is happening, it is happening, I'm seeing it before my very eyes, then it's going to become a, a, a mass kind of wild fire of consciousness and part of this is just retraining the way that we kind of go about everything in our lives and victory is one of them that if we can start to see victory as a, a true kind of human spectrum a rich experience of just being the greatest human I can be which means like a face in the mud and you know, the glory of it all, all the whole polarity. If I can do that, then there's something that starts to kind of imprint in me and and that becomes something that people are inspired by and that's victory. If you can become in any way an inspiration to another human being, that's a victory. This is real life and, and we're all, we all have our moments of whatever. The, it's hard, it's hard to be a human on this planet right now. And there are many people who are kind of burying their head in the sand and just, you know, going for the zombie thing because it's easier. Um, and so to be human, it's a, it's a real experience and it's gonna hopefully, I hope for you that it is the whole spectrum of everything, the, the greatest heartbreak and the most love that you possibly can experience because that's why you came here. This is like a huge kind of what we've forgotten and kind of the birth trauma and the whole um, uh, just uh, wild whatever you've been through. You're, it's called childhood. Um, whatever you've been, the trauma, i.e. your childhood um, that you've been through, which could be actually traumatic or it could have not been that traumatic, but the way that it kind of configured in your structure is in a traumatic way. The subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between a real event and an imagined event which both can work as a very difficult thing because that means we will take something that didn't even actually happen, create a whole thing around it, and then live our whole life in a suffering around that particular thing. So at the same time, it can be used as one of our greatest kind of assets because 
when you start to use the subconscious mind, which is, this is what meditation is. I mean, meditation is a self-hypnosis. So you start to use the mind, which is a great tool and a time-space machine, and you can travel anywhere simultaneously, literally instantaneously. So it's an incredible gift that we've been given. So you start to use the mind to imagine something more positive, which is the whole victory thing. Yogi Bhajan calls it our positive imagination, which is a very simple way of saying most of the time we're in our negative imagination. So most of the time we're imagining the worst case scenario and how the thing and the, you know, and worrying and then all the hormones and the adrenaline and the cortisol and the, and then we start to, we start to contract physically. The body starts to contract and then we can't take a breath and then, you know, the brain chemistry goes off and it's, and it, this all happens very, very quickly. So we can use the mind to positively imagine. And I do feel like there's a difference, just to be clear, between the kind of um, affirmation culture and the positive imagination. Because positive imagination is literally, you're, you're in your meditative mind, you're, you're putting a laser beam of a reality of what is the your kind of most empowered, most victorious, most um, enlightened, most creative, most whatever kind of state, you're putting that as kind of a laser beam into the time stream. So the, the all of time and space starts to organize around that reality rather than what we do unconsciously and subconsciously is we're putting the laser of, well, you know, he's acting this way, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna get weird. And then, cause I know he's probably gonna try to leave because you know my dad left and you know like so we were creating the self-fulfilling prophecy basically so and we have the capacity pretty quickly to do something else so that's one thing that you can you can start to really in your kind of meditative mind which can be just 60 seconds abraham says something like 68 seconds is what you kind of hold, uh, the amount of time you need to hold to start to organize a different frequency. Um, that's short, you know, that, that's not long at all, a minute and eight seconds. So something like that up to, you know, I'm a zealot, so we meditate for long periods of time, but it doesn't take much to get this thing kind of locked in. And then you have to rinse and repeat. You have to keep going back to it, because think about how much you've spun the neurotic, self-sabotaging, negative kind of trauma, drama stories. So you have to keep on just like doing any kind of practice. You have to keep on doing it. It's all breath. This is like, we are, we're basically programmed to contract and, and breathe shallow. And if we breathe shallow, we physiologically and chemically can't produce the type of chemicals and the type of experiences of reality that are, you know, more expanded, bottom line. So you got to train yourself to breathe a little bit deeper because most of our breath patterns have to do with how our mom was breathing when we were in utero and a lot of our mothers were really scared and you know, I always say this but like uh, this whole soul group you know all the, the the newer and newer soul groups are heavier and heavier kind of amazing incredible beings and so a lot of times we kind of drop into our mothers and the mother kind of freaks out because she realizes oh no like I got this like incredible being uh, that I have to deal with and like I have to kind of you know do something with myself and all that kind of so so there's that process that happens and whatever pattern of breath that she was having maybe she was scared or nervous or you know whatever going through all sorts of things um, that's the pattern of breath that was installed in us so we have to work to teach our bodies and all of our bodies in kundalini yoga we have more than the physical body all of our bodies to start to expand instead of contract and that's just a, a basic breath thing. So the moment that things get weird, I'll start there, you know, and do like take a couple deep breaths. And then if I need to like, you know, break some kneecaps or whatever, like all's fair in yoga and meditation. <laughs>